Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. On behalf of the Veritas organization and the Catholic Campus Ministry here at Montana Tech, it is a great pleasure and an honor to welcome you at our third annual forum on science and religion. I'm Patrick Beretta, I'm parish priest here in town and also chaplain to the Catholic students at Montana Tech. So what is Veritas? What is the purpose of this forum? Basically, what we're trying to do, what Veritas does, and we're supporting them and bringing them on campus, is to invite students and faculty and our guests from the community to reflect, especially if you are in a field of science, to reflect on the great questions that have captivated and nurtured and inspired humanity for millennia. And we're also addressing a misperception out there that the faith and reason, science and religion, exist in a state of conflict. That's one of the areas that we try to address. So this is a very inclusive gathering. There are people, there are people here who do not believe, and there are believers here. And among those of us who believe, it's a very ecumenical gathering covering many denominations and religions. So welcome, all of you. And what we like to do with these forums is to really encourage conversation and dialogue and debate. And we have a very, very exciting program for you this evening. And I want to tell you a little bit of what to expect. Our guest speaker, I will introduce him in a moment, is going to cover the first 35 minutes of the program. And then we're going to have a fascinating dialogue, question and answers, between our guest speaker and our moderator, whom I will introduce to you in a few minutes. In a few minutes. And then we're going to have an opportunity for all of you here, and I would like to give a priority to our Montana Tech students, to ask questions of our guest speaker, or maybe of our moderator if you want, and then to close the evening, we're going to have a reception, we have some food, we have some beverages, and we would love you to stay, enjoy something, speak to people, ask maybe an additional or question or two uh, to our guest, and, and uh, that will close the evening. So I want to begin by introducing to you our moderator. I got to know him. And he's a local Butte gentleman. He went to Butte Central. Uh, he's a terrific guy. And uh, I want to read a little bit about his career, which is incredibly impressive. He received his degree in, bachelor in science here at, at Montana Tech in general engineering. And then he obtained a PhD degree from the University of California, Davis, in me mechanical engineering in 2007. He was then a graduate researcher with the Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Center in Berkeley. And then from 2003 to 2012, he was, he was with Sandia National Laboratories in Livermore, California, where he was a principal member of the technical staff before accepting a position as assistant professor of mechanical engineering in the General Engineering Department of Montana Tech. He has been working in the field of nanotechnology and microelectromechanical systems since 2001. His research, interest, his research interests include technological advancements in the understanding and application of nanoscale devices, materials, and methods. He is married. He's got three young boys. And the big news about our very honored uh, moderator, Dr. Jack Skinner, is that he has recently been appointed department head. A big thank you for Dr. Skinner for accepting to moderate. A few months ago when I was speaking to the Veritas people, 
uh, the gentleman out of uh, Seattle sent me a few links and he said, can you see if you think there is a professor there, a speaker there that you would find interesting? And after I listened to the link, the video of our guest of honor, Dr. Colin Bewey, I said to Kyle in Seattle, he is the guy. I really hope we can get him. He is from Ohio, and uh, he is professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. Now, people think of us at the, the MIT of the West, but he is the real MIT <laughs> in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He attended Stanford University as a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow and obtained his PhD in 2009 in mechanical engineering. Professor Buey spent a year at UC Berkeley as a postdoctoral fellow. Talk about a career. And at MIT, his laboratory explores fundamentals of electrokinetic phenomena for application in material science and microbiology. His research is applicable to a diverse array of problems from anti-biofouling surfaces and biofuels to energy storage and bacterial infections. Professor Buey is the recipient, among many other awards, of the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2012. He is married, and in an interesting parallel with Dr. Skinner, he also has three young children, but they're three young girls. Two boys and a girl. Oh, two boys and a girl. Then I apologize. Two, two, boys, two boys and a girl. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Colin Buey. Thank you so much for the introduction and um, thank you all for, for coming out. It's, it's great to be here. If we can get the lights, the guys with the lights to get our, there we go. Um, so we're going to talk about science and faith and I'm going to spend the first few minutes just talking about my science. So what do I do all day? And you don't need a PhD to understand this talk, so I'm hoping everyone will get, uh, will get a little bit of something out of this. So this work is uh, definitely collaborative. So I've been at MIT for eight years. So I'm just going to talk about two specific things going on in my group to spark your interest a little bit. All the people that you see underlined, those are former students and postdocs that have worked on this. Uh, and uh, Professor Gerges is a collaborator from Harvard University. But before diving in, I actually have to tell a, a personal story. And the personal story is this. Um, it's interesting that me and Daniel were both at um, Sandia for, uh, or in Livermore for a while. Um, I, was, I was at Berkeley, and then I actually spent a summer at uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, which is um, you know, essentially right next door to San Sandia Labs in Livermore. And um, my PhD actually involved fuel cells. And shortly after I got to MIT, I started working on more biotech problems. And one of the reasons for it is uh, some tragedy that struck my family. So my sister, who uh, was 35 at the time, I was actually visiting Lawrence Livermore Laboratory to talk to collaborators about six months after I started my job at MIT. And I got a call from my brother-in-law just saying that my sister had passed away. Now she wasn't sick. She wasn't, there was no chronic illness. This was just sudden. So June 10th, 2010, I get a call, my sister is dead. And it turned out that she had died from a bacterial infection, uh, from something known as sepsis. Anyone here ever heard of sepsis? It turns out the mortality rate for sepsis, even in the United States, is around 30 to 50 percent. And my sister was a doctor, and this, this, this like, after getting over the initial shock, this kind of um, captivated me that bacteria were still killing people in 2010. Um, and so I started really just on my own, personally, just looking up and just trying to understand more about bacteria. And I learned a lot of things, and one of the first things I learned is basically that bacteria rule the world. And I, I, I really, I'm not joking, I think bacteria rule the world. One, they've been here longer than us. So we, if you think about life, life has been on the planet for billions of years. Um, most of that single-celled organism, we are, we are like a blip at the end. Um, when you think about life. Think about resiliency. Now, you guys here, you, you guys are resilient. <laughs> but bacteria, they can live, you know, the deepest oceans, tallest mountains, high temperatures, 
hydrothermal vents at the bottoms of the oceans, low temperatures. They really set the limits, you might say, physical limits for life. Next, they're very productive. Some of you may have just had dinner, so perhaps this is not that appetizing, but in, in just one of your stomachs, there are more E. coli than humans that have ever lived. Just one of your stomachs, more E. coli. And that's just one species of bacteria. There are actually thousands of species that live in your gut. And because of that, if you take all the humans and you take all the lions and all the tigers and bears, oh my, and everything from the Lion King, you take all the animals and all the plants and you put them on one scale, and then if you put the microbial world on the other scale, it's about 50-50. So because they're so productive, even though they're small and you can't see them, they're everywhere. They're massive. So they have a huge impact on global processes, even though they're small. Now they don't just have an impact on big things, they also have an impact on us. Show, quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of the uh, Human Microbiome Project or the Human Microbiome? Okay, so the microbiome is essentially the realization that these bacteria and microbes that live in and on our body actually have a strong effect on our health. They've often been called, these, these organisms are often uh, referred to almost like another, they're almost like another organ in terms of how much um, influence they have on your health. So for example, your body actually contains more bacteria cells than human cells, a number of cells. So you are more microbe in terms of number of cells. Now by mass, you're more human. But by number of cells, you're more microbe. There's a tremendous amount of diversity in the microbes that you, that you have. Even between your two hands, there can be up to 83% difference in, um, you know, in the microbes on your hands. I jokingly like to think, I think it's because they sample different environments. Like I, I'm often on my phone with my left hand, and I'm often you know, choking pea sets out of undergrads with my right hand. <laughs> so they just see different environments, and that's why they have different microbes. <laughs> there are also a lot of interesting correlations. So if they were to sample all of our stomachs today, they could tell us who was breastfed, even today. So signatures from those early stages of life are still remain in the microbes that are in and on your body. Now, there's a little secret, and uh, probably many of you don't know this, but most of the bacterial world is unexplored. So what do I mean by unexplored? So let's say this globe, this map of the globe represents all, this surface area represents all the bacterial species on the planet. It's estimated that they're around tens of millions of species of bacteria on the planet. So that's 10 to the 7. Now of those tens of millions of species, <coughs> about 10 to the 4th have been isolated and characterized. So that's way less than 1%, like 0.1%. So that's like essentially the area of Alaska. So imagine the whole globe, all we had explored was Alaska. Now that's just what we've isolated. If you think about fields such as genetic engineering or synthetic biology, where we actually use microbes in order to produce useful things for humans, you need organisms where you can actually manipulate their, their DNA. Those organisms, it's around 10 to the 2. So another 1% of the 1%. So all of the advances you hear around genetic engineering of microbes is on essentially 1% of 1% of the organisms on the planet. That's like the air of Connecticut. Now, this is interesting to me. Make sure my mic is still going. This is interesting to me as an engineer, partly because if you just take one species, E. coli, you guys often hear bad things about E. coli, but E. coli actually produces a lot of useful things for humanity. E. coli makes tens of billions of dollars per year in enzymes and chemicals for industrial use. So just one species. So as an engineer, I see all this space and think how many other E. coli-like organisms could there be out there that we, right now, can't even get our hands on? So my group, my research group, looks at basically these two, you might say, 1% problems. The first problem, there are all these microbes on the planet that we can't even get a hold of. How do we cultivate and get our hands on some of these organisms to learn more about them? And then, of those that we can get our hands on, how do we make more of them amenable to manipulation and genetic engineering so that they can do uh, more useful things for mankind? So on that first problem, this is a well-known problem in microbiology. It's called the great plate anomaly. So when you typically when you cultivate bacteria, you streak them on plates. 
these plates basically give them food where they can grow. And it's been known for a long time that 90 to 99% of the bacteria you might see in an environment do not grow on these plates. Now, one of the reasons for this is that microbiology is a field that has largely grown out of necessity in the sense that it's grown from our need to understand infections. And the beautiful thing about infecting bacteria is they grow very easily and they grow by themselves. They grow like weeds. You don't need to do special things to get E. coli and Staph aureus to grow. That's actually one of the things that makes them, that make them pathogens, is that they grow very easily. And they also grow by themselves. The problem, though, is that in the environment, I talked about all these millions of species, you almost never find them by themselves. But all of our techniques for finding microbes rely on isolation. <coughs> So in the environment, they're always in communities, but then all of our techniques in the lab isolate. And I, I thought about this uh, with a colleague, and, and we kind of came to the conclusion, you know, maybe we just don't have them in the right type of environment for them to grow. Maybe they need community. And you know, I thought about it like, would, would I thrive in isolation? If you took me and put me 50 miles east or west of here, <laughs> I'm probably going to die. <laughs> There, there, there are a lot of things I need to live. I, I need Whole Foods, for example. I need the police, because I might be, you know, I'm not a small person, but I can't protect myself. I need Google, I need information. Sometimes useless information, but I need information. So I need a community to survive, and bacteria are very similar. So one of the things we did in my lab, we, we created these devices that essentially allow bacteria to live within communities. So what you see, this is an artist's rendition, where you see these micro-scale chambers where we can put essentially one cell, and these cells are physically isolated from one another, but the walls of the chambers are porous. You can almost think of them like prison cells. So the bacteria can talk to one another, but they can't touch. And so because they can talk to one another, they can exchange metabolites, they can exchange goods, they can exchange food, but they can't touch. So if they grow, we still have an isolated strain. So we have a physically isolated strain, but they can communicate chemically. So an example of this is shown here. Here we're exploiting something called quorum sensing, where these red cells, or the red that you see, those are fluorescent bacteria. And there are thousands of them, which is why you see it just blanket bright, bright red. And so those fluorescent red bacteria, when they reach a certain population density, they start secreting a molecule. The green bacteria, they only fluoresce green when they sense that molecule. So essentially when they sense this communication. So when you see the green and the red, they're actually talking to one another. And we're visualizing that communication using these colors. You can almost think of it like a social networking platform for bacteria, bacterial Facebook maybe. Um, so let's say I look at the orange organism, it can talk to the green one, it can talk to the blue one, but you see that yellow one is kind of isolated. And so we're using this to try to understand how bacteria relate to one another in communities and to grow those, you know, 99% of the organisms that are currently difficult to grow using isolation alone. So earlier I showed this picture. I want to talk briefly about the second problem. So that's something we're doing to get more of these organisms to grow. But what about making more of them amenable to processes like genetic engineering? So it's, uh, genetic engineering is already changing our world. So here I'm showing numbers for market sizes for genetic engineering using microbes and, uh, and bacteria. These are already multi-billion dollar markets in therapeutics, chemicals, and in biofuels. And there are new frontiers where there's a lot of investments, investments such as synthetic biology, where here I'm showing just last year about a billion dollars was pumped into new companies that are trying to leverage synthetic biology for genetic engineering. Now there's another problem here. The problem is that genetic engineering is not deterministic. It's unpredictable. So who here has an Android or an iPhone? Okay, so many of you. So when you bought your phone, you buy your phone, it's got some software loaded and some hardware. But if you need a ride, if you need Uber, you actually have to download an app. So you have to download this app. That app is software code. That code interacts with the hardware and software already on your phone. And now your phone has new functionality. Now your phone 
you can be anywhere all over the world and use this ride sharing app to get where you want to go. That's precisely, I think that's a great analogy for what we want to do in genetic engineering. In genetic engineering, you want to take foreign code, genetic code, and you put it into a cell, that foreign code interacts with the native code and native hardware and software already in the cell to give you new functionality. Now the problem though is, is that what you get out isn't deterministic. So in software engineering, we're far better at engineering your code that will lead to our desired output. In genetic engineering, it takes a lot of trial and error. So this, uh, this trial and error process is known as the design, build, test cycle. Design in the sense that you design your code, your genetic code that you believe will yield the output that you want. You build it, you take that code and then you put it into the cell. That's the, you put it into the machinery. You then test it because you didn't know what you're gonna get. You have to test it afterwards to see what you got. And then you learn from what you, you learn from what you see. Now, there have been advances in recent years in three of these areas. So in the area of design, the cost of DNA synthesis has been plunging rapidly. So now it's very cheap to synthesize DNA. Because it's cheap to synthesize DNA, you can test a lot of different code. So that allows you to do, test a wide array of code so that you can figure out which code is going to lead to your uh, successful um, genetic engineering project faster. In the area of testing, there's high throughput testing, things such as facts, that allow you to take the results that have come from your cell and figure out which ones are giving you the output that you like. And then in the, the area of learn, there's been many advances in bioinformatics and machine learning that allow you to take all this data and figure out what is happening inside the cell. However, this build step that I'm showing here at the top right, they're essentially doing many of the same technologies that they've done 30 or 40 years ago. So everything else has been advancing, but the speed at which we put things into the cell has been about the same. One of the ways this is done is something called electroporation. So in electroporation, you have a cell and you have electrodes. So here I'm showing a cell, the two black bars are electrodes. You apply a potential and the cell polarizes and the surrounding media polarizes, but there's gonna be a potential drop across the membrane. So essentially, you have a uh, disproportionate accumulation of charge inside and outside of the cell and so the cell actually feels some stress because of this charge difference. It turns out that when that charge difference leads to a potential that's around one volt, the cell will actually open pores to relieve the stress. So you apply an electric field, the cell feels this electrical stress. When that stress gets high enough, the cell opens pores because opening pores allows ions to move through and lower the stress. Now when you open those pores, not only ions can go through, but things like DNA or CRISPR constructs or other things can get into the cell that you want to do for your genetic engineering. So I'll skip these two. Basically that's what I said. Once the potential gets around a volt, these pores open up and allow things to travel in. Now this process of electroporation unfortunately is very slow and tedious and involves a lot of manual pipetting. So even today, where we have automated liquid handling robots and we have bioinformatics. When it comes to electroporation, generally speaking, it's still very manual. Uh, I went to a company that's trying to leverage automation um, in order to do high throughput genetic engineering, and they have 96 volt plates automated moving all around their lab. But when it comes to electroporation, they take the plates off the line, and they have two PhDs pipe heading back and forth and hitting a button to do the electroporation. So even now, the state of the art, they can do maybe 20 to 100 samples per hour. And so um, when people want to do high throughput electroporation, um, they, usually, they usually try not to um, because it just takes too long. I think uh, the, this problem has been, uh, um, I think, uh, articulated well by a 20th century philosopher, Sweet Brown. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> So we were, we were looking at this and we thought, well, could we do any better? So there have been advances in all these other areas. How do we make this faster? So what we've done, we've taken what normally happens in those cuvettes and we've put them inside of a pipette tip. So that entire electroporation process that used to happen in a cuvette and revolve, involved a lot of pipetting, we actually put it into a pipette tip 
So now the very instrument that's doing the liquid handling can now do the delivery of the foreign DNA. So it turns out that this is about 10 times faster than what you can do using the manual process of pipetting. It's more efficient because of the way we're delivering the electric field. But we can also scale this up very easily to 96 or 384 experiments in parallel. Ultimately, this process will be about 10,000 times faster than what people can do. <coughs> So to put 10,000 in perspective, that's like the difference in speed traveling by rocket to the moon versus a racehorse. So 10,000 times faster. So this is just some data. The main point of the data is we're better than the state of the art. That's the, <laughs> that's the, the, the main point. Here I'm showing the number of, here we were looking at E. coli, the number of E. coli that we were able to genetically uh, transform or change compared to the state of the art. And this is just on a single channel, so this is not 96 in parallel. So we're already a couple orders of magnitude faster um, just using a single channel in terms of our ability to deliver uh, uh, DNA to cells. So being at MIT, we, uh, we actually founded a company to, uh, to try to leverage this, and we were funded by a new ecosystem at MIT called um, the engine. So when you look in the back right, that's me. Um, on the far right, that's Paulo Garcia. He's my uh, uh, co-founder in this venture, where we're looking to really make this even faster um, and apply this um, um, broadly. And to, to give you some perspective, I've talked a lot about bacteria, but it turns out that this is also um, useful for mammalian cells. And some applications that we're looking at now um, involve cancer immunotherapy, for example, where they want to take your immune cells and engineer them to find your cancer rather than giving you chemotherapy. So I'm going to end the, the research uh, side of the talk, but I feel like I wanted to let you guys know I am a real scientist. They didn't just find me off the street. <laughs> well, they did find me on the street, but <laughs> I happen to be a real scientist. A lot of this work has been funded by um, by, uh, by gender support from government agencies and tax dollars, NSF, DARPA. I'm a big proponent, personally, of funding federal research because it, you know, it impacts my livelihood. But we've started this company, and that company actually grew out of NSF and DARPA funding, which is taxpayer dollars. Right? So those taxpayer dollars are ultimately moving towards something that's going to be commercial and will be, you know, hopefully, more jobs. So with that, I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I want to talk about our subject, which is uh, can a scientist believe in God? So can a scientist believe in God? And to get into that, I think we're really talking about faith. So in the introduction, you know, we, faith came up, like our faith and reason, are those things incompatible? So I think we first need to talk about, well, what is faith? So if any of you are like me, I want to make sure we're on the same, have the same working definition. If you go to a subject for the first time, uh, what, do, what do you do? Google search. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually pretty sure some of you probably Google search me. If you Google search me, this is the type of stuff, uh, stuff that you get. Unfortunately, my name is very unique, and so when you Google me, everything you see is me. So I can't hide on the internet, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, thankfully for us, just like LeBron James and fake news and the Black Panther movie, Faith actually has a Wikipedia page. So you can look up faith on Wikipedia. So I'll give you uh, the Wikipedia definition of faith, and it's this. Faith is confidence or trust in a person or thing or a deity or in the doctrines or teachings of a religion. It may also be belief that is not based on proof. Now you'll notice here from this definition that faith is, faith is firstly a trust in a person or a thing. Now you may not think you have faith if you don't believe in God, but the fact is, all of us have to have faith every day just to live. You may not have faith in God, but you're putting faith in other things just in your daily life. For example, you go to a stop, how many of you go to a stoplight and the light turns green and you start going before looking? But do you look both ways to make sure no one's running the red light? You actually don't. So where are you putting your faith? You, you have faith that the other drivers on the road are going to obey the laws. Right? So even if you are a skeptical person, many of you, many of us, exercise faith every day. So now I'm a parent, and uh, as a parent, you, uh, you learn a lot of things. 
And uh, one of the things that you learn is that when it comes to parenting, everyone is just making it up. <laughs> Particularly these days, everyone is just making it up like no one's ever been a parent before. And, and there are all these new, new, uh, new fads and new things that people are doing to raise their kids. And uh, uh, recently, we ran into this. We have a daughter who's two years old, and my wife was going back to work, and we were looking for a nanny share. So in a nanny share, you have two or more families that are going to pay for a nanny and share the cost. So it's usually a little bit cheaper. Um, it's kind of like in between, between a daycare and just having your own private nanny. It's a little more personal, but um, it's not quite as expensive as having a nanny by yourself. So along the way, um, now we were lucky enough to find a family, but along the way, the nanny that we found, uh, she told us about an experience she had with a previous client, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> This, this family had some pretty strict care, uh, care conditions for their six-month-old. Now, the first thing, they wanted the baby to be in a new activity every 15 minutes. <laughs> All day long. So let's say at the top of the hour, you're reading a book. Then 15 minutes later, you're playing with dolls. Then 15 minutes later, you're listening to music. 15 minutes later, you're playing with toy trains all day long and it had to be different things and the parents actually kept a stopwatch one of the parents worked from home and kept a stopwatch to make sure that the nanny was changing every 15 minutes so now, unfortunately that was not the worst part of it <laughs> the worst part of it was that the parents insisted that the child had to be fed on one of these so the, the, so the nanny had to sit on one of these bouncing balls and feed the baby. Like a six, any of you ever held a six month old? Like they're all squirmy and they're, it's like it's, it's bad enough as it is. So th they wanted the parents, they wanted the nanny to sit on this bouncing ball and hold this six month old. I mean, I could just imagine there would just be just applesauce, applesauce everywhere. Like not, not in the baby's mouth. It's like a horrible idea. Now, where, where did they come up with this? In, in fairness to them, everyone's just trying to do the best they can. Maybe they read somewhere that, you know, switching activities was good for a baby's brain development. Um, I think it might lead to ADHD. But they, they, maybe they read somewhere that this was good for the child, and maybe the bouncing they felt was soothing. But they don't know how that's going to turn out. They don't know if that's going to lead to a student, you know, lead to someone that kid gets into Harvard one day or or leads to a college dropout. Like they, don't, they, they think it's going to lead to good outcomes. They're exercising faith. There's no way someone has done a study on sitting on a bouncy ball <laughs> with a six month old to see how that projects out to future life. Right? They're operating using faith. So what is faith? And my, my definition of faith, so when I talk about faith, faith is belief in a person or thing with incomplete evidence. Incomplete evidence. So I don't actually ascribe to the Wikipedia definition of no evidence. It's incomplete evidence. So when I talk about faith, I'm talking about having incomplete evidence in the situation, but still acting based on that incomplete evidence. Now, as I've already talked about, I'm a professor at a university, and uh, my job involves two things. It involves teaching and research. Now, the teaching, I just take what's in a textbook. I take no knowledge and... Um, pretty poorly delivered to students. <laughs> so I take what's known and deliver it to students so that they can use it later on in their lives. Now in research, we actually are at the frontiers of knowledge. So we don't know what we're going to find. We don't know, you know where we're going. We often will take a hypothesis, but that hypothesis is based on faith. If we knew what was going to happen, it actually wouldn't be research. When you know what's going to happen, that's what's in the textbooks. The boundary of what you know is research. So scientists actually have to conduct research using an awful lot of faith. Like if you were going to be a top-notch researcher at the frontier, by definition, you have to exercise a lot of faith because you don't know where you're going. You don't know what is going to happen in the end. So I'd like to give some examples of people in science, and including myself, that exercise faith at various points. Now, when I went, to, I went to Stanford for graduate school, and when I first got to graduate school, I was tasked with designing a new type of fuel cell. So a fuel cell, you could think of it like a, 
like a hybrid between a battery and a combustion engine. So a battery takes chemical energy and converts it directly to electrical energy, which is one of the reasons they can be highly efficient. But an engine takes fuel, combusts it, and turns that into mechanical energy ultimately. In a battery, you have a finite amount of charge or a finite amount of chemical energy that you can use. And then once you've used it, you have to plug your battery back in or switch out the battery. For a combustion engine, as long as you have fuel, it keeps running. I say a fuel cell is like a hybrid because a fuel cell also, like a battery, converts chemical energy directly to electrical. But like a combustion engine, it runs on a fuel that you continuously bring in. So you don't charge a fuel cell. A fuel cell has a, a fuel tank. And so as long as you have fuel in your tank, you can continue to derive, uh, derive your energy. Now in particular, I was looking at low temperature fuel cells. And in these fuel cells, we were taking hydrogen and air and getting useful energy, waste heat, and water. The problem in these systems is that the water is low temperature, and so some of the water is in liquid phase, is, water, is liquid water. But we have these gaseous reactants. So as you build up this liquid water, it actually can prevent your gaseous reactants from performing their, their function at the electrodes. Sorry, did we lose the mic? Okay. Seems like the mic is going in and out. I apologize for that. Um, maybe I will, do we have the other mic? try this. We'll see how this works. Um, so as I was saying, you have these gaseous reactants that want to react at the electrode, but you have these, you also have this liquid water which is building up, which is a product of the reaction. And so you have to be able to get that liquid water away in order to have an efficient fuel cell. And so what my task was, was actually to design a fuel cell that used these pumps that have no moving parts. So what I'm showing at the top, that's actually a pump. So what you see moving in and out is liquid water. And these pumps use something called electroosmosis, which I know sounds a very complicated word. Essentially, we apply an electric field, and upon application of electric field with these really small channels, that pump consists of several small microchannels. And when we, when we apply an electric field, charges in those channels move and pump the liquid. So we have this pump with no moving parts that we could integrate into a fuel cell. Now, when I was first tasked with this, uh, with this research, there were two PhDs, so two postdocs, who had been working on this for six months and were unable to get it to work. In fact, uh, my PhD advisor gave me this project, and one of the postdocs pulled me to the side and said, uh, that's never going to work. <laughs> so, um, you might say, ye of little faith. <laughs> but in spite of that, in about six months, with a lot of long hours and a lot of effort, I actually derived the fuel cell that you see at the bottom, <clears throat> which ultimately led to my PhD. So ultimately, I got this thing to work. Now, in all those long nights, I, what was the evidence I had? The evidence I had was, well, I knew these pumps worked, and I knew fuel cells worked, but no one had ever integrated them. And in fact, the, the two postdocs who had tried before me had both done so unsuccessfully. Now, what was it that kept me going? I didn't have any examples to say this was going to work. It was faith that I was ultimately going to be able to make this happen. There was no way I knew that it was going to happen. Now, in a lot of cases, for any of you, many of you in science, and including myself, I've had faith that ultimately turned out to be unwarranted. The ultimately, the thing didn't work. But yet still, what keeps you going in those moments, in my opinion, is faith. You have this incomplete evidence that you think something can happen, and you keep, uh, you keep pushing through. So I want to, give, uh, want to give some other examples. Another example um, is the story of the light bulb. So who knows, who, who is this? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Okay. So Thomas Edison is uh, credited with uh, inventing the light bulb, though he had a huge team uh, to help him do this. So the story of Edison actually began well before he actually invented the light bulb, because several other people had actually invented incandescent light bulbs before Edison. What Edison did was make one that was lower cost and slightly better efficiency and lasted longer. 
So he made a lower cost, more durable uh, light bulb, you might say. Now, Edison was a, a, a pretty interesting character, and he was so sure that he actually started working on this project to make a low cost light bulb to make gas lamps obsolete. And he actually pronounced victory before he had it. <laughs> so he actually came out and said that, you know, gas lamps and other types of lighting were going to be obsolete. And uh, two years later, he still had nothing. Now, could you imagine if Apple announced an iPhone <laughs> and two years later still didn't have one? Uh, th that wouldn't be a good look. Now, in spite of, you know, those setbacks, Edison had, a, Edison had a lot of critics, had a lot of critics as you could imagine. Um, but in spite of those setbacks, he kept plowing forward. And it turns out that one of the key elements that he was missing was the right filament material for the incandescent um, lighting process. Over several months, his team tested over 6,000 different filament materials. Six zero zero zero. Then, and when they, they ultimately found a suitable carbon material, and in 1881, at the Paris Exhibition, um, they debuted their, their new light bulb. And the demonstration was a huge success. Now, I have to imagine that along the way, maybe material 5,000, they had to think, they must have had some doubts. Yet they continued to work. They had doubters. They were losing money. They were, the press and the media was all over them. There were probably many chances where they could quit. What keeps someone going to get to that 6,000, to get to that actual you know, material that's going to work? I would argue that that thing is faith. Now, there are other examples, so let's pick a more modern day example. Who knows what this is? The Collider, all right? So this is the Large Hadron Collider at, uh, at CERN. So I would say, I wanted to pick this example because one of the things that's come out of this, uh, this large uh, system has been the discovery of the Higgs boson. So this particle, uh, which was postulated by several scientists, including uh, Peter Higgs, had eluded particle physicists for many decades, roughly 50 years. Yet they believed that they had the, if the right equipment, mainly this collider, they could ultimately find it. Now this collider cost $10 billion with a B, $10 billion. Now using this system, um, several groups have actually believed they found the Higgs boson. So the question I ask is, why would a community of scientists spend five decades and countless billions of dollars in search of a particle whose only evidence was theoretical? I would say that's faith. Now perhaps it was faith in themselves or faith in their theory and equations, but it was faith nonetheless. So what have we talked about? I gave a personal example, I gave the Edison example, I gave um, the example of CERN. Now I'm gonna assume that there's still some skeptics out there, so I'll give one more author authoritative voice, Lord Voldemort. <laughs> now towards the end of the final Harry Potter movie, when everyone thinks the chosen one, Harry Potter is dead. Now I'm not even gonna get into the fact that, you know, here you have this chosen one, and he dies and come, comes back for his friends. And, yeah. I won't get into the parallels with that and, and Jesus. But if we just talk about what he says, Voldemort um, tells Jenny Weasley, when they think Harry Potter is dead, I'll do my uh, Voldemort voice. Harry Potter is dead! <laughs> From this day forth, you put your faith in me. Now, notice that he doesn't question the existence of faith just where it should be put. Even the Dark Lord knows we all have it. So why, why do I bring up these stories? It's because I think, as mentioned earlier, a lot of people would have you believe that faith and science are like oil and water. And that just isn't the case. I would actually argue that faith is critical to science, not just something that can be tolerated by science. Faith is critical to science. Many of the greatest minds in history employed faith to advance frontiers in science, and those same people, many of them also have faith in God. Some examples include Max Planck, who was a pioneer in quantum mechanics, and Francis Collins, who, lead, who led the Human Genome Project and is currently the director of the National Institutes of Health. And if you ever visit MIT, I could actually introduce you to dozens of faculty, like myself, who have their first family, first faith firmly placed in Jesus. Now, 
the faith that you put in people, that's closer uh, to what I mean when I say I have faith in Jesus. You might say it's similar to the faith that I have in my wife. I can't prove to you without a doubt that she's trustworthy. Nobody can, how could you prove someone is going to be trustworthy? But I know her well enough to place a lot of confidence in her and to believe that she's worth safe sharing my life with. Now, for the young people in the room, if you wait until you have all the evidence <laughs> before getting married, none of you would be here. Your parents wouldn't have gotten together. I mean, you met your dad. You know your dad. You know. <laughs> if your mom would have waited until she was sure about your dad, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> so we don't live in some world where some people employ faith and others do not. Everyone exercises faith. The real question is not if you exercise faith or if you're a person of faith. The question is where is your faith? So faith is not some purely religious construct. It's really essential to human flourishing. Without it, it'd really be impossible to make it through life. Whether you thought about it or not, you have faith in a number of things. Maybe you have faith in the US government, or maybe you have faith in the goodness of humanity, or maybe you have faith that one day science will eradicate all the world's major problems. Now it's possible that some of you in this room have never thought about things in this way, and you really have no idea where you put your faith. Now if you're curious to find out, I'll give you a quick test. Look for your hopes and your fears. Your hopes and your fears are often pointers to where you put your faith. So for example, if your biggest hope is finding a good job, then perhaps your, your faith is in financial stability. Your faith is in money. Or perhaps your biggest hope or your biggest fear is of living alone. Then maybe your hope or your faith is in uh, human relationships. So look at your hopes and your fears. Those are often pointers to where your faith is. Now what I would suggest for everyone in this room is that you identify where your faith is and test it. Just like you would any scientific hypothesis or theory. Now how else would you know if your faith were in the right place? So everyone has faith. You need to find out where your faith is. And now I'm saying that I think you need to test it. So the next question is, well, how would you test it? Now thankfully, life actually provides all the tests that you'll ever need. This world, this world is full of many challenges and setbacks. And my question to you is, can your faith handle them all? There are some forms of faith that are adequate in good times or in a small subset of life circumstances, but can they handle everything that you might encounter? Every time you encounter a new challenge, what I would recommend is you should ask yourself, how does my worldview or my faith account for this situation? Does your faith provide adequate answers to all the questions in your mind and your heart? And if not, you might need faith in something else. So as I mentioned earlier, my faith is in Jesus Christ, but it hasn't always been there. I, wasn't the, I didn't grow up in the church. I actually became a believer um, in Jesus in college. I went to The Ohio State University, and through a relationship or friendship with a roommate, um, I really admired what I saw from his life, and it made me curious about Christianity. And I started going to church and ultimately um, uh, gave my life to Jesus. So it was through a relationship later in life. It wasn't the way I grew up. But I will also say that though it came to me later in life, that faith has definitely been tested. Now one of my most vivid tests is uh, something I already mentioned, and uh, is the passing of my sister. So my sister, a 35-year-old mother of two young boys, had suddenly inexplicably passed away. I had been a Christian for about 10 years at that point. Now it's easy to say your faith is in Jesus Christ or in science or anything else when life is going well. How does your faith hold up when you have to call your parents and tell them that their firstborn child has just died? Now my wife and I were expecting a baby, but I couldn't get over the fact that my son would never meet his aunt. And I had a lot of questions. Many of you have been through situations like this and maybe you've asked some of these questions. If God is loving, why does he allow tragedies like this? Was this punishment for something that I had done or that she had done? Now interestingly, I'm a scientist and last time I checked, the mortality rate is 100%. <laughs> Death is the most natural process of all. We all know we're going to die and see others die but why does it still feel unnatural? 
Death might, like I said, might be the most natural thing of all, but any of you who ever, ever had a very close loved one die, there's something just not right about it. <coughs> now, I must confess that I never got an answer to many of my why questions. But what I did get was something better. Now, all the questions I had about my sister really boiled down to one. God, how can I believe you love me if you'd allow so much pain? The answer is this. Through Jesus, and really only through Jesus, do you have a God that endured pain. Jesus came and suffered so that we wouldn't have to suffer alone. There are many faiths and many religions out there, but none of them purport to have a God who comes down and enters our, enters our world, sorry, comes down, enters our world, and suffers with us. The question of suffering comes up often when people try to um, have counter arguments for Christianity. And they say, for example, the question usually goes like this, how can there be a loving God when I see all this suffering in the world? And my answer is always the same. I don't believe in a general loving God, some omniscient, benevolent God um, that's kind of, uh, kind of mystical. I believe specifically in Jesus because Jesus, as depicted in the Bible, is a God who came down and suffered with us. He suffered with us. So it doesn't tell you why we suffer, but it does tell us why not. It's not because he's not good. It's not because he doesn't love us, because he suffered with us. Think, of the, think about it. Anyone who you love, you've suffered with. Anyone you love, you've suffered with. So I can believe in a good God, because, and I can believe in a loving God, because Jesus suffered with me. If Jesus didn't suffer, I couldn't believe. I couldn't have made it through my situation with my sister and still believe in a loving God if that God didn't suffer. So to close, my question to you is not if you have faith, it's where is your faith? Where is your faith? And when you locate it, I suggest you test it and you look and find out, does it really answer all the questions that you have about life? And if not, I suggest you uh, explore and find something that will. Thanks. Can please le lift the screen and Dr. Bue and Dr. Skinner will join us on stage and have a conversation from there. And so we're going to have 20 minutes for their conversation and 20 minutes for questions. Like we said, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Turns out we have some of the same, um, know some of the same people. One of my friends, a professor at Virginia Tech, and does uh, electroporation, electroporesis for a lot of years. Um, a lot of questions about that. Maybe I'll talk to you about research later on. But I mean, we have some high school students here. There's some college students and some community members. And so, you know, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned the story about your sister, very touching, and you became a Christian. In, uh, in in college, right in Ohio. So, do you ever look at that 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 whole timing of events and think that maybe maybe that was like God might have touched you before your sister passed away so that you could do what you're doing now? Yeah, I I, I absolutely believe that, and I feel as if God has had His hand in and all my life, my whole life. It's not just that I became a Christian and. Um, started developing a relationship with Jesus and then from then on, it's really there's, God was working on me my whole life. And so I absolutely believe that, I, I guess I believe 
to, to, to try to say it succinctly, um, my life has a purpose, and everything happens for a reason. There are no accidents. And so the order in which things happened was very deliberate. It had to happen that way for God's purpose to be ultimately fulfilled. And even the bad things that happen in this world um, can fulfill an ultimate good purpose. And so I believe that they had to happen that way, um, even, the, even the tragedies. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think that's, a, that's probably the right response. Um, do you think that, uh, um, like when you think about before that you became a Christian, and, and look at the, the, the troubles you had. He was sharing a story with me. I was talking about basketball. I was I watched the Warriors last week when I was in the Bay Area. And uh, Dr. Dewey is a fan of, uh, of the Cavs, right? So he may not like the Warriors much. We start talking about all. we start <laughs> we start talking about shoes and and, and how he, he had one shoe, pair of shoes that, he, that, that that got taken from him when he was, when he was younger, right? Yep. How would you deal like you know someone takes your shoes as a kid, right? Um, Maybe, maybe uh, you'll, you lose a loved one, you fail a test, um, uh, you, you get a speeding ticket, some bad things happen, right? Um, how, 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 does a, how does a non-Christian deal with trouble in their life versus someone who actually is a Christian? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I've now been a Christian for mo most, of my adult, most of my adult life. And prior, I think I was I lived life with a lot of anxiety. I think that's just, there's, there's no way around it. And growing up, I just had a lot of anxiety. I was anxious about a lot of things and didn't really feel a lot of security in life. So things really, things really brought me down um, in the sense that, you know, if I, got, if I got a B in a class, it wasn't that I thought I had a B in a class. It was like, I, well, I, I must be a B person. You know, I was a, I'm a B person. Or when bad things would happen, I often questioned, like, well, I probably deserve that. I had very low self-esteem, extremely low self-esteem. Now, not everyone deals with things this way, but me, pre-Christian, pre-Christianity, I beat myself up. Like, something went wrong, it was my fault. I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I deserved it. Um, even things that I didn't need to beat myself up about. My parents got divorced in, in high school, and a lot of people can, can relate to this. I blamed me. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people do that. And I was very good at blaming me and had very, very low self-esteem. And God has been working on me for the last couple decades. It's still a work in progress um, to get me out of those bad thought habits. So now when those anxious thoughts come up, I have verses that I can go to, such as, you know, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, present your requests to God, and the peace of God will transcend. And the peace of God well, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the end of it. Ah, anyways, Philippians 4.13. Um, I, I have scripture that I can go to to tell myself a new truth compared to what I would do before. When I was younger, I, had, I told myself a different truth or different lies, you might say, about, about myself. Um, so now as a, as a scientist and an engineer, you know, mechanical engineers eventually sometimes become scientists, and <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> or at least we have friends who are scientists. <laughs> so, so when you approach a setback, and I like, you know, that you per you persevere, right? And that's a that's a great trait to have, no matter, you know, what walk of life you are, Christian, non-Christian. Um, how do you deal with problems? And I, I I guess it comes into this this whole thing about faith. And, and doubt, and those two things that intermingle with everyone. Christians have that too. So can, can you talk about faith and doubt and how you approach problems, especially as a, as a professor working with, with some smart people, some, some you know, future engineers, and then some colleagues. How does that faith and doubt play into the work that you do when you're solving problems and you know, engineering, science, and biology, this whole um, combination of what you do? How does that fit in? Yeah, I think the, the way it fits in for me is probably on the surface, I don't know that my work looks very different than other people around me, but I would hope that the people closest to me can see a difference. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to give a couple, of quick, a couple of quick examples. One is, um, so I, re I recently got tenure, and the whole way working up to tenure, 
I did my best to work as if I already had tenure. That's really hard to do psychologically because you know you don't have it. <laughs> but at the same time, if what I, I was, it was really a test for me of my faith in the sense that if I believe what the Bible says is true, which is that the Lord of the universe sent his son to die for me so that I could have communion with him for the rest of my life and throughout eternity, what could MIT or anyone else take away from me that could possibly compare to that? Like if I really believe that, how would, how would I live my life? And so for example, the way it played out practically is, you know, my wife and I, for example, and, I, and, I, and this, I don't mean for this to sound judgmental, but we didn't wait, for example, to have children. We had a lot of, I have a lot, a lot of people that I know in academia and other places, they put their family on hold for their career. But for me, my family was more important than my career, and one of the ways that played out is I didn't make them wait for tenure. Partially because what happened with my sister, my sister died at 35, I'm 36 right now. How would I, how do, you know, it just kind of put life in perspective in the sense of, um, you know, a lot, a lot of times people put things off and say, oh, I'll do this when I get there, or when I get there. How, you're not guaranteed to get there. Um, you're only guaranteed today. You don't have to be sick to die. You don't have to be old to die. And the Bible teaches that, that very same thing. So I worked, you might say, as if I had tenure. The, the phrase that I would say to, say to people is if I had tenure in heaven. God, and, and not a tenure that I earned, but a tenure that Jesus earned for me that no one else could take away. If I really believed that, how would I treat my students? How would I treat my family? How would I, how would I treat my colleagues? How would I pick my research problems? I, I was a bit more, in some ways, ambitious and took some risk, partly because you know, I, tried to, I tried to live that out. It wasn't perfect, but that's how I tried to live out my work. Yeah, great. Um, so one of the things that always comes up when I was asked to you know, MC this, um, you want, want, the, the scientists and, and engineers, and a lot of these people were scientists and engineers, and, and, and all, you know, they did everything at once, and mechanics. A lot of the equations that we actually refer to in the fundamentals in the textbooks, um, a lot of these, these people were Christians, right? If you go back, and, and they basically tried to get closer to God by understanding nature, right? His creation. And, and so, you know, things have changed somewhat from those times, you know. Um, what are your thoughts on that, like the reasons why that's happened in the, sci you know, in the scientific community, that it's, you know, there's been maybe fewer, fewer scientists that are driven by, you know, they're not Christian, Christians at all, and, and it's basically, you know, God is kind of out of, out of the picture. And so, what are your thoughts on that, like, how did, how did how the scientific community get to that point? What do you think it will go in the future? Yeah, I think there, there are a couple reasons. I'm not an expert in this, though I am very fascinated by the question. I think one of the reasons is that there's been a lot of skepticism and antagonism, maybe, between the church and science. So you had many cases of the church persecuting scientists who were Christians themselves. So those very unfortunate historical events, I think, have start, started driving wedges between the, the church community and, uh, and the scientific community, where as you say, it used to just be one, right? People were, people viewed science as a way of worship. People viewed their scientific work as a way of worshiping God. You, and, and, that's, and that's, how, that's how I view it, in the sense that I read Genesis, and I read that the world was created, and I think the personally, I, when I read Genesis, what I read is why the world was created. Like, the world was created for God to to, to, to enjoy, you know, the first day, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and there was evening and morning, God said it was good, and then there, it repeats, and God said, and it was, and God said it was good, evening and morning. It's like a poem, it's like a love song that God has for creation. And as a scientist, and as, particularly as an engineer, I feel like in some ways we are like reenacting we're like being, we're doing creation with a little c, right? Where we take, you know, you think of our teaching, we take um, a young mind and we, you know, create or we foster the ability to think in different ways. Um, 
and we get, we get enjoyment out of that activity. We take a problem and we come up with a solution that leads to a, a higher quality of life or leads to others to solve new problems. And we, we get enjoyment out of that. And I really think one of the reasons as scientists and engineers we enjoy that is when we do that, we are, we are mimicking our creator and we are, we are worshiping. So I, I think one of the reasons for the drift away has been kind of skepticism of the church for science. Um, there's this thought that, oh, scientists are trying to explain away God, and so we don't want to have scientists around. And that has kind of put up this, in my opinion, a false barrier between church and the scientific community. Because it's not, there's no word in the Bible that suggests that you know, man should explore the creation of anything. What I see from the Bible actually encourages that exploration, not discourages it. That's a good point. So um, when, uh, when you go around and, and, and you were sharing, this is probably the smallest school he's been to recently, although you were, what was the smallest school he went to recently? Colgate, maybe? Colgate, but he was some really big schools. So when you go around and, sp and spread in your faith, um, you know, um, do you, I mean, you might see some, some opposition, some people who are going to challenge you a little bit. Um, what's your thought, though, about as a scientist and, you know, truth versus hypothesis and trying to back up that hypothesis and, and um, how, does, how does Christianity stand up to scrutiny? When you come out here and, and as a scientist, the facts are the facts and, and, and how have you seen that play out in terms of Christianity being challenged over all these years? Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. And to me, it, it all kind of starts and ends with Jesus in the sense that I believe that Jesus is real. He was a real person who was God, who lived on this earth at a real point in time, affected real people's lives, really died, and really was resurrected. I believe there really was a resurrection. I believe Jesus is real. He's not some idea. I believe that's a historical fact. And so what, what so then you might ask, well, what are the evidence? What's the evidence for that historical fact? If you look at others in history, um, a great example I've heard is Alexander the Great. And the writings on Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great were like four or 500 years after he lived, yet they're considered authoritative. The writings of, of the apostles and the gospels on Jesus were 40, 50 years after he lived. Like, relatively speaking, that's like Twitter for the ancient world. Like, how, and Paul's writings are even, are even sooner. Paul's writings, um, his letters to churches, which some of them very clearly lay out the gospel message that Jesus lived, he was God, he died for our sins, and was resurrected. Um, Paul's writings were just a couple decades after, after Jesus lived. So for people of that day to spread lies about Jesus would have been like, us today saying lies about Bill Clinton when he was president. So Bill Clinton was president, you know, ended in 96 or so, or, or George Bush when he, when he was president. You couldn't make up a story that didn't happen with so many people around who were there, still alive. And so I believe that Jesus was a real historical figure, and if he was real, and if he is real, then, then you just have to deal with it. <laughs> Right? It's, it's not a matter of opinion on, oh, do I want to believe in him or not? It's like, well, if he's real, then what do I do with this information, this man who said he is the way, the truth, and the life, who died and was resurrected? Like, I have to, I have to take his writing seriously. And then a lot of other things flow from that. Jesus quotes a lot of the Old Testament. Jesus believed in the Old Testament. So if Jesus was real, and Jesus really was God, then, and he believed in the Old Testament, was inspired by God as well, then that's what, I have, to, I have to deal with that as historical fact. It becomes not, it becomes no longer a matter of opinion. It becomes, well, what do I do with this truth? I can just deny it and assume that it's not there, but, you know, I've chosen to, to live, a, you know, in accordance with that truth. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Skinner, maybe one final question for this segment of, of the evening. Okay, we'll get to that one <laughs> so, um, I, I guess uh, there's some students here, and there's some, you know, uh, do, you, do you have do you have some 
maybe some advice as they go on and, 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 and try to pick some colleges and go out through life. And I know there's some people from Central and, and a lot of people of faith in the room. Um, can you talk about that faith and that decision, you know, to be a Christian and, and how they might expect, things they might expect as they go out there and interact with the broad, outside of you, the broad community, the scientific community, um, and, and maybe some advice for them to, to, so, that, so that they might be maybe less shaken as they, they experience life. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think the Bible, for example, I, I think the Bible can be viewed in some ways, this is, a, this is a stretch of an analogy, but like an engineering textbook. So if you look at any engineering textbook, let's say you're, um, I'm teaching thermodynamics at the moment, so let's say you're in a, a chapter on the second law of thermodynamics. A lot of theory is presented up front. And then at the back of the textbook, they present problems. Right, for you to work out how that theory works in practice. And you actually don't know the second law until you've worked out the problems. But just reading the theory isn't enough. And I believe wholeheartedly, being, being a Christian is the same way. And actually it's the same way with whatever your faith is. You need to put it to the test and you need to work it out. So for example, the Bible has many promises. You need to work those things out. When things come up, you need to go to it and use it. And that's the only way that it actually is alive in your life. I think a lot of people profess faith, but don't actively use it. They profess a faith in Jesus, but then when real trouble or when real decisions come up, they, they, they act like everyone else, which is why a lot of Christians have been a bad witness. Right? The world looks at us and they see... They see murder, they see bigotry, they see hatred, they see racism, they see all kinds of unfavorable things. They think, well, why would I become a Christian if like, you guys are doing all this bad behavior? Um, I think we need to use our, we need to actively use it. Um, and to be clear, I, I, will say, I will say this, that it, it works, but it did, it's not true because it works. It works because it's true. So it's not true because it works, it works because it's true. And then you also you need to have a definition of what does works mean. Works doesn't mean you always get your way. Works doesn't mean my sister doesn't die. My sister still died. I have, uh, I have three children. One of my children has a genetic disease where his life, ex life expectancy is his early 40s. Works doesn't mean that he isn't born with that genetic disease. He was a Christian when, I was a Christian when, uh, when we had him. Uh, works is how I deal with that life circumstance. Like, how do I approach life? How does he grow up? Um, what is the witness we have for the world in spite of those circumstances? So to be clear, works doesn't mean life goes your way um, all the time. But um, I think my advice is really to work out your faith and to, and to work it into your life. Don't just pay lip service to it. but really live by it and and try to you know have your actions consistent with your with your words all right that that's uh that's some great words of advice um so let's uh maybe thank the uh, professor uh, Dewey. Exactly, exactly. And then we will wait for you to point out to, to the person and uh, Pat or I will bring the microphone and then you can address your question to either Dr. Dewey or even Dr. Skinner if you wish. So, who would like to, uh, to begin? If you don't ask questions, um, you have to stay here for an hour listening to <laughs> And I'd like to give a priority to our students, so raise a hand. Who wants to, to be the first one? Otherwise, we'll go back to the conversation. Oh, there you go. There you go. Here's McKenna. Well, first, I just want to say thank you for making the trip out here and for your wonderful talk. Um, but I guess my question is this. You talked a lot about faith starting with 
or your definition of faith being incomplete evidence. So in research and in science, a lot of times there's conflicting evidence. And in our society and faith, a lot of times we run into people who claim conflicting evidence um, regarding faith. So how do you deal with people and ideas, um, both in research and in faith, that are directly conflicting? Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a, good, that's a good question. Um, so I'll give one maybe faith example. A faith example will be, um, I, talk, I have some friends who, uh, who, are, who are Muslim and something that they'll say occasionally is, oh, I believe Jesus was a good guy. And uh, like there's a belief in Jesus and, and, and even some, a following of some of his teachings. And I actually don't believe Jesus was a good guy. I, I kind of believe uh, it's bimodal. Either Jesus was God or he was crazy. <laughs> Like the stuff that he said, I don't know that I don't know that it actually leaves much of a middle ground. And so I think it, it sometimes takes some some. Uh, I actually don't have a problem with conflict. Conflict actually I think can lead to can lead to truth. Um, I think a bigger problem these days is more apathy, where it's does it matter? It's not oh was Jesus real or not? It's does it matter that he was real? Like, I can, can't we just live in, in his spirit? Or like, why, why does Jesus have to be the only way? I think that's a, a bigger danger. I see at least on the, faith, on the faith side. It's not that people have conflicts. It's much more so that there's this thought, well, you can have your faith and I can have my faith and this person can have their faith. And it doesn't matter what that faith is. I think that's a, it, it basically, it basically is saying that what you believe doesn't matter, regardless of what it is. Just kind of like a watering down of, of you know, spiritual life, which I think is a bigger issue than our conflicts. When we have conflicts, there you have two people that have passion and actually believe that it's important. I can, I can have a great discussion with someone who's passionate from a different angle, agnostic, atheist, Judaism, because we, coming from a point of passion, we both believe this thing matters, and I can actually relate to that a lot more than um, the belief that, oh, it doesn't really matter, right? Now, on the science side, um, conflict is interesting because you see a lot of, uh, sometimes you see some pettiness <laughs> come out of conflict. I don't know if you've seen this in... No, in, I have not. In, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, <laughs> I mean, we like to think of scientists as being, as being objective, but I, I'll never forget talking to a colleague who was proposing a new theory in an area that wasn't his. He was a physicist and he was getting into something in biology. And he was not a religious person, but what he said was that the way people attacked him was very dogmatic and almost, and almost uh, like persecution. Like they had a belief in their theory and then when he proposed his new way of thinking, which had evidence, people vehemently attacked it within science. And there are lots of examples of that within science. We like to think of scientists as these, you know, benevolent, purely rational people. But we're just people. We're really just people. And some of the same problems you see in other areas of the world, you see in science. So even amongst rational thinkers, you see often there's a lot of reluctance to accept a new theory. You know, there's a lot of revisionist history in science, and we make it think like it's just been this linear progression. But uh, I, so I'll give one quick one quick example. Sorry, I'm like talking too much. You guys need to ask questions, or I'll just talk all night. But um, I heard a, a, a talk by Richard Feynman, or read a transcript of a talk by Richard Feynman. One thing he talked about was something called pathological science, where you get an idea in your head, and then your you take your hypothesis and you look at it as real. And then you look at all your data through that lens, and then you basically get the answer that you wanted. So an example of this was uh, the, the elementary electronic charge. And so Milliken, in around the turn of the century, turn of the 19th century, got like 95% of the way to the fundamental electronic, electron charge. And then it took the scientific community 70 years to get the next 5%. So he get, did all this work and got 95% of the way there. And it's because people 
as they would do their data, if they were too far from Milliken, who had a Nobel Prize, then well, there must be something wrong with me, right? Because it must, Milliken was right. So the charges creeped up for 70 years <laughs> until they got it. Because people didn't believe data that was too far from what Milliken had. And that was, that was scientists. Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Who's next? Oh, what would be like your uh, viewpoint on the like, science's explanation for like the formation of stars and planets, or like evolution, like us all coming from single cell organisms, as opposed to like Genesis and the Bible? Like, what's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, I alluded to this a little earlier, and I will admit I am not an expert on um, astrophysics and the theories of the early universe. Uh, what, I, what I will say is this, is that I view Genesis as certainly the first couple chapters of Genesis, not all of Genesis, but the first couple chapters of Genesis are more, in my opinion, telling us why the world was created, not how. And, and so there, there are a couple examples of this. One is, let's say if we take, we take the creation story, I should probably just read it, but let's say we take the creation story, you know, and God said, let there be light, you know, and it was good, and then it's like evening and morning the first day. But the sun isn't created for like a couple days. So how did you have a day before the sun was created? It's like, and, and so then the question becomes, well, why is it conflicting itself? Well, I think it's because it's not talking about a day in our sense. I think, it's, I think it's talking about a time period. It's indicating some period of time, a passage of time. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's depicting our day. But all that said, I don't think the point of it is to tell us how. I think the point of it is to tell us why the world was created. It was created for God to enjoy. God loves the world. He enjoyed it. He celebrates and dances over the world. And this world is created, thus this world is good. This world isn't an accident. I, I read, I actually was reading a book around creation and Genesis from a, actually from a, a, a particle physicist. And this, uh, this particular gentleman was Jewish and he pulled out some old writings. There was a Jewish scholar who like a thousand years ago essentially postulated the Big Bang. Um, and, and it was totally based on his exposition of Genesis. And with the way the characters were written and the way Genesis is set up, he wrote like a thousand years ago that the universe expanded from something no, no, no larger than a mustard seed, which is a very tiny seed, um, with a tremendous ex, you know, ex, uh, explosion of energy. He basically describes the Big Bang long before Einstein, long before relativity, long before any of that stuff, and he gets it from the Bible. So, I don't know, I, I don't, I think that the Genesis is one of those things where it's not really meant to push for the details. I think that it's not, it's not supposed to be a scientific treaty on how the world was created. Think of who, it, who wrote it, it was you know, written thousands of years ago would that person, if God had said, let's, let's, say, let's say hypothetically, if we said that the Big Bang Theory is correct, how would he have explained it? <laughs> how would God have explained that to a man thousands of years ago? So anyways, I don't see, I don't see any issue anymore. Right? When I actually first became a Christian, this was maybe my biggest hang up. When I first became a Christian, I believed that Jesus was real, and I believed that there was a historical Jesus. But when I read Genesis, it just didn't make sense. It's like, how was this, how was the world created in X number of days? It just didn't really sit well with me. And it took a long time of stewing over it before I came to where I am now, where I, I feel perfectly comfortable with what's written in Genesis and my scientific beliefs. So I'm a student in mechanical engineering, and uh, Dr. Skinner is one of my professors. So sorry about that. Before I ask, well, <laughs> before you ask me a question, I want to take advantage of this golden opportunity and say he's my favorite professor. 
Uh, Brandon, uh, he needs to cla pass his classes this semester. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, this question is open to both of you, but going along the lines with your definition of faith, I have to uh, trust that you have faith that the Bible is true over conflicting religious texts. So what do you see as evidence in favor of the Bible over texts that say um, the, the Quran with uh, the Muslim religion? So I'll give a quick caveat, and this caveat is that um, I, this is a tough question because I haven't studied the Quran in depth, and so I'm not I am not an expert on the Quran. I'm I'm, I'm a lay I'm a layman with the Bible. Like I've read the Bible through cover to cover many times, but at the same time that doesn't make me an expert. Like I haven't read it I haven't read it in its original language. I haven't seen the original you know, scrolls that they were transcribed from, which some people have. So my caveat is one, I'm kind of a lay expert in the Bible, and I'm not even that in the Quran. But what I, what I will say is this, one thing to me that makes the Bible unique is that reading it all the way through many times, one, there, is a, there is a common story. And there's a common story that is revealed by God to man over millennia, and for example, if we think of if you think of Exodus, Exodus, the story of um, the nation of Israel um, being um, being liberated from bondage in Egypt, and then thousands and thousands of years later, when you read about Jesus when he's transfigured transfigured on the mountain, so there's a there's a scene in the Gospels where Jesus goes up on a mountain and Peter, James, and John see Jesus' face shining bright like the sun and they see Moses and Elijah. The original, when in some of the texts, what it says is that Moses and Elijah, they're discussing Jesus' exodus with him. And, and it's specific that they use the word exodus because that exodus from um, earlier in the Bible is not just about the liberation of the people of Israel, it's pointing to Jesus. Everything is pointing to Jesus. And just that unifying thread throughout the whole Bible just makes it so compelling to me. And every time I read it, I just see that thread more and more. And it's whereas, for example, with the Quran, the Quran was inspired to give it to one person. The Bible has dozens of authors all weaving together into the same message. It's kind of like if one person were to come and tell me something, I would say that's interesting, and I would consider it, particularly if that person were very trustworthy. But if five dozen people come and tell me the same thing over many millennia, that would be even more compelling to me. So I don't want to, I can't say the, you know, I can't speak to the accuracy of the Quran, but the way the Bible is revealed to many different authors over millennia with a common, very common thread and message is pretty compelling evidence to me that it is inspired by God. Any more students? Otherwise we, we open it up to uh, non-students. Anybody from the faculty wants to ask a question? Uh, you alluded to, uh, we talked about a film by the name of Collins, who worked in the human genome. And as I recall, he was an agnostic. And because of his work on the genome, he saw things that he said, oh wow, it, it, this couldn't possibly be by chance. There has to be a God. And so my question to you is, in your scientific work, have you ever run across the situation where a light bulb came on and he says, this can't possibly be by chance. There has to be a problem. Well, what I, I, what I will say is this. I don't think I've discovered or worked on anything quite as significant as the human genome. <laughs> but what I, I would say almost weekly, something happens or I see something in the lab. And what I will, I don't know if I'll say there has to be a God, but what I will say is I marvel at the beauty of creation. Like when I, I was talking about the bacteria, I really am fascinated by bacteria. The fact that there are so many different types, um, 
all the things. So there, there are, there are bacteria that live in our gut that appear to respond to, and in some cases stimulate neurotransmitters. So there, there are like bacteria in your gut. So there are some people that joke that, you know, do you want a cheeseburger or do the bacteria in your stomach want a cheeseburger? <laughs> <laughs> and just thinking of the just thinking of the complexity of life, um, I, I will say, like I, in my work, I see a lot of things. Like my, we've done some fluid mechanics work of droplets and rain, and we've seen some beautiful images. And when I see those things, I think, wow, this creation is this world is so beautiful. Like it doesn't it doesn't feel like an accident. But I will say maybe my you know biggest realizations of God, some of them have just been personal, like with my children. Like you, you witness childbirth and you witness pregnancy and you see all the things that have to happen for to, 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 to ultimately get a healthy baby, to see how often it goes right, to me is a miracle because there's so many ways it can go wrong. There are so many different steps at which it can go wrong. The fact that it, the fact that it ever works to me is like a, is like a miracle. So, I would say yes, maybe not in my own work to the level of Francis Collins. I hope that one day I do something that's so profound that it will be um, um, very compelling evidence for the existence of a creator and an intelligent, you know, design or or or, or plan behind the world. Um, but what I will say is, a lot of my work, I look at it and I think, wow, this world is amazing. It's amazing that the world works like this. It's so beautiful. It's so. Um, intricate and so ordered, um, and it's further evidence to me that, or further reinforces my faith, I guess. We have time for two quick last questions. Yes, uh, earlier you challenged us to live the Bible, and um, a big part of that is evangelizing. Do you find it appropriate, or when do you find it appropriate to evangelize, whether in school, campus, or at work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, so I'll try to make two quick points. Uh, anyone here seen uh, Black Panther yet? You can, you can be honest. <laughs> so so a, few people, a few people have seen the movie. Anyone here, love, love back up. Anyone here ever seen a great movie of any sort? What do you do after you see a great movie? You tell people about it. It's, it's actually, I've heard it argued that, you can, you, can, you can think of it this way, you haven't really enjoyed it until you've told someone about it. Like if you had a great meal in town, like if you go to Park 217, right, you have a great meal, you're like, you wanna tell people about it. Like you actually haven't really completed enjoying it until you told people. So in some ways, I feel like evangelism is just a natural, it's just gonna be a natural um, um, result of really experiencing Jesus. Like, if you, if, if you realize that, like, like I said, the Lord of the universe loves you individually so much that he would send his own son to die rather than live in a world where he couldn't have a relationship with you. Like, that is such amazing news, it would be really hard to keep to yourself. Now that said, who would you tell it to? I, I think it's it's often, not that not that uh, you know street evangelism and other things are wrong, but it's kind of easier to do in a relationship, right? It's like when you have a, when you've already established with someone that you care about them, and you're not just telling them this, and it's clear there's no ulterior motive, and it's also clear that if they don't believe it, you're still going to be friends. I often think that that's a great place of, of evangelism. It's through relationship. So make, kind of start a relationship with people and just as you would you know, tell a friend about a great movie you saw or a great meal you had, even more so, you would think that if they're living in close community with you, you're gonna tell them about, about your faith. And so I think part of it is having friends, friends that are not of your faith. Like not just talking to people that you know don't believe what you believe, you know, in passing, but like make friends in class, right? Make friends deliberately. Make friends with people who disagree, and 
you'll probably learn some things about yourself because they'll teach you some things. And you'll be in a better place, in my opinion, to evangelize when they know you care about them for them. Not just, you know, you're not just telling them this and then you're going to walk out of their life. One last question. Um, in your journey of evangelism, I think you, are, you might have faced some challenges. So, um, do you have, can you give us some of the examples of some of the challenges you faced and how you dealt with them? Yeah, I think, um, so honestly, I haven't had that many challenges. Um, and I'm not sure what, the, what that means. I, I do have, I have plenty of colleagues that are not believers. And uh, maybe they just tolerate me. I don't know. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe I need to be out there more. Maybe I'm not out there enough. Maybe if I were out there more, I would, I would experience more, more challenges. I will say I do remember a couple instances where, for example, before ever giving one of these talks, I had two different senior colleagues, not at my university, but people I would consider mentors at other universities tell me, you know, you shouldn't do things like that. Because you don't want people, you know, like when you're going up for tenure, you don't want people to be able to look online and find out potentially controversial stuff about you, like maybe they're not a Christian, or you, you just don't want people to find stuff like that. And <clears throat> to me, doing that would have been saying that, well, it's, Jesus isn't Lord, tenure is Lord. Right? So tenure is Lord, and then Everything else must be subject to that. And so, I, you still have to be wise. Like, I didn't, like, you know, go to my department head and, like, you know, say, you need to go to church or you're going to hell. <laughs> right? Like, I was, you know, you could be savvy about it, but at the same time, I didn't, I didn't hide it. So... How did that feel after tenure if you told them that? <laughs> I, I, I did tell, I still haven't told them that. Um, and I wouldn't tell them that. I wouldn't tell anyone that. Um, but that's not good news. That is part of the Bible, but that's not the gospel. It, it was part of it. It is part of it, but that's not, the, that's not the good news. I would hope that I could share the gospel with him and he would, um, he would listen. Not that he would, I, who knows what, what he would do. But a lot of my colleagues know that I'm a Christian. I don't hide it. So I'll, I'll be in a meeting, and I, I was in a meeting two days ago talking to junior faculty about, um, about funding, and I shared with them, I'll share this story, so I'll, can I share another story? I have lots of stories. <laughs> uh, maybe four years ago, so right in the middle of the tenure process, I went through a very severe funding drought where for about a year to a year and a half, literally every proposal that I wrote didn't get funded. And it wasn't like I wrote two or three proposals. This was 15 to 18 proposals over a year, year and a half, didn't get funded. And I was uh, very distraught. Because it's easy to think, well, I need this funding in order to hire students. I need students, you know, so my group can publish journal papers, and I need to publish journal papers if I'm going to get good letters, and if I don't get good letters, I'm not going to get tenure. Like, that's like where my mind went. And I'm in a group of faculty that meets roughly every month or so to pray. And I remember distinctly meeting with the group kind of throughout this period, and one particular meeting just really laying it out like, hey, I really need prayer for this because while I know that I am saved and while I know, you know, that... I am loved, I still want to do well on my job. <laughs> and like, I don't want to be a failure at this. Like, help my heart wrestle through this. And uh, I actually shared this with the junior faculty, uh, all of the story. And so in sharing all the story, I was sharing the fact that I'm a Christian. And now it turned out that for whatever reason, reasons I'll never, I'll never explain, I, you know, I remember after praying with this group of faculty, that when I got home and prayed more about it, I really came to peace with the fact that what I really wanted was God to bless my plans 
And I had to reevaluate. If God wasn't blessing my plans, did that mean that I wasn't loved? So I thought I knew how I was supposed to get tenure and how my life was supposed to go. And that's what I was really distraught about. It wasn't that God was doing anything wrong. It was that I had this plan, I thought I knew how things were supposed to go, and it wasn't going my way, and so I was distraught. And once I realized that, I actually got a great deal of, uh, I, maybe you might say, peace from it. And literally the next day, a grant I had written got funded. Like literally the next day. And I shared this story with the junior faculty partially to tell them that you, can have, you, you might have troubles and struggles, but it could be all right. But then also to share my faith and kind of what helped me through, through that situation. Thank you. Dr. Buey, everybody here wants to know whether you and your wife have adopted the bouncing ball technique of feeding the children. <laughs> At this point, we'll do anything to get them to eat. So if that would, if that would help, we would do it. But I, my, it wouldn't help. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Skinner, Dr. Dewey.